Hi, welcome everybody and many thanks for joining us for our webinar on care homes, retirement housing and the coronavirus, responding today but what happens next. Our webinar has been made in collaboration with our partners, Anchor Hanover Group, Audley Group and supported by the ILC Partners Programme. My name is Donna Buxton, I'm the Head of Research here at ILK, ILC and um, I'll be your chair today. So, ILC's role we are a, char a UK charity and a specialist think tank on the impact of longevity, longevity on society. We help society understand and plan for the future in the light of demographic change. We want to play a part in helping government, individuals and industry deal with the impact of coronavirus today and tomorrow. The time to act is now. We have three key COVID-19 priorities. Understanding the impact of coronavirus today, supporting society through change and preparing and adapting for a new future and what happens next. So before we get started, there are a few housekeeping rules to go through. Internet issues may affect sound and videos, so please do bear with us if this occurs. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat function to communicate with panelists and delegates, as well as a Q&A function where we'll be collecting questions from panelists. If you are having any issues with the audio or video throughout our webinar, then please use the chat function to let me know. If you get disconnected from the webinar, do use the same link from the confirmation email to join back in. And you are all invited to post comments throughout this webinar on Twitter using the at ILC UK handle and the hashtag housing and care event hashtag. So before we start today's webinar, I just wanted to um, tell you a little bit about our partners programme for those that are interested. Um, there are three key benefits for joining the programme. Firstly, business intelligence will give you advance notice of our latest research and, and ad hoc briefings on areas of specific interest to your organisation. Secondly, networks and connections. So our partners events have included visits to number 10, briefings with prominent influencers, as well as the opportunity to meet ministers, policy experts and fellow partners. And finally, we have brand benefits for being a partner. As a partner, your brand will be visible through our numerous events, press releases and presentations, and it will give you the opportunity to be positioned at, at the heart of the debate on longevity. So that's some detail on our partners programmes and on, on the slide there you can see our current partners. So this webinar has a, no a number of aims. Firstly, it will seek to provide practical advice to organisations who are providing care and housing services for older and vulnerable people, but also to learn how these organisations are responding. We, we will also seek to explore and ask today, will what we have lived through drive a sea change in the social care sector? What does the future of social care look like? What does the sector need to do now? And finally, will the learning from what we've lived through drive more innovation and integration of health and social care for the most vulnerable? Today, we have an expert panel of speakers who will highlight examples of good practice on how their organisations are currently responding to the crisis. And, and the speakers will explore what additional support is needed from government over the short term. Today, we have Professor Martin Green, OBE, who is the Chief Executive of Care England, and he's also Chair of ILC. We have Jane Ashcroft, CBE, who's Chief Executive of Anchor Hanover Group, who are one of our partners. Shirley Hall, who's Head of Innovation and Wellbeing at the Extra Care Charitable Trust. Nick Sanderson, who's CEO of Audley Group, who are another one of our ILC partners. And finally, Tom Owen, who is Director of My Home Life. So before we hear from our speakers, I'd just like to run a couple of very quick polls past you all. We'll have one minute to respond to these, and then I'll share the results afterwards. So the first poll, in the current climate, would you be happy for one of your closest family members to go into residential care or retirement housing? So you have one minute to respond to this question. Thank you. Okay, we're in the end of the poll. And the answer is almost 
categorically no, although we've still got some that would do still. So there's a, there's a little bit of a mix there, mixed bag there. And then the second poll, which is interesting actually, the second poll is, in the current climate, would you be happy to go into residential care or retirement housing? So you've got another minute to answer this question, please. Thank you. Okay, and so the uh, results are going to come up shortly. Okay, so in the current climate, would you be happy to go into residential care or retirement housing? Slightly more saying no for themselves, or more or less, this, yeah, actually almost the same. Okay, we'll return to this poll later on. Me. So, I'd now like to introduce you to our speakers and the key questions we'd like them to consider. Each speaker in turn will consider these questions and there will be time at the end uh, once each speaker has spoken to answer questions. But you can also submit your questions to our speakers using the Q&A feature in the bottom bar of your screen throughout. So please do. And please can I remind you again that you are all invited to post comments on Twitter throughout using the at ILC UK handle and the hashtag housing and care event hashtag. So I'd just like to introduce Professor Martin Green, OBE. So Martin is Chief Executive of Care England, which is the largest representative body for independent social care services in the UK. Martin is also Chair of ILC, a trustee of Independent Age, Vice President of the Care Workers Charity and a champion of the National AIDS Trust. Martin has had an extensive career in NGO development, both in the UK and internationally. So Martin, can I now invite you to comment on all of some of these questions that are going to be presented to you on the screen shortly? Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you very much, Donna, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for coming to this webinar. Um, in terms of where we are in this COVID-19 crisis, and I do think it is a crisis, I want to address the questions that have been put to me, but I also want to talk a little bit about some of the future things and also some of the things that have been exposed by this crisis and some of the organisations that might need to change uh, because of the things we've learned from this. Um, in terms of where we are, I think providers are doing an amazing job. I think we should acknowledge that pretty much every single person, certainly in residential care, and also many people in supported housing, are in the high risk group of people who are going to be affected by this virus. Whether they're older people or indeed people who have got learning disabilities, just about everybody who's in the care and supported housing sector have got some of these conditions and are in the high risk group. And I think that for me has been brought home as to why we should have prioritized housing and care much more fully at the start of this pandemic. I think care providers are doing an absolutely magnificent job. And um, I really want to pay tribute to the frontline staff who have really gone the extra mile. And I think one of the things we should acknowledge is at the start of this pandemic, there was not a lot of support for either residential care or supported housing, or indeed for home care providers. And what we saw was this tremendous commitment by the staff in those services to make sure that first of all, they were protecting their residents and that they were also very clearly uh, saying they wanted to make sure that all the outside influences that could have potentially brought the virus in were, were being mitigated. So I don't know if you remember, but at the start of this process, a lot of care services, a lot of housing services went into lockdown and they were given quite a lot of criticism about that. And the reason they did it was because they understood how vulnerable the people in their care were and they were doing everything to protect, protect them. So I think we should really acknowledge that. 
Um, I think organisations by and large have coped, but I think there have been some really big systemic issues that have not helped us. So first of all, the whole focus on the NHS at the start of this pandemic, on some levels I understand why that was, but we knew that there were going to be lots of people in care and housing services who were in the most vulnerable group. And so we should have not so much thought about organisations, but thought about where those in most need were. And we should have addressed that from the very start. And I think that's been a lesson that's been learned. Um, I think also staff have really rallied around and supported each other because a lot of staff had to self-isolate. So what we saw was staff having to manage very complex needs and fewer of them. So I think that was a big achievement, the way staff managed to fill that gap. I also think what we've seen from this crisis is the interdependence between health and care. And one of the unfortunate things, and one of the things that I think we've learned a lesson from at the start of this pandemic, was we saw primary care withdrawing from, from both health, uh, both social care, residential care and housing. And so what should have been there to support us was taken away. So all our district nursing in some areas was taken away. So I think one of the challenges was that suddenly care workers were having to do things that other professionals should have been doing. Um, and they responded to that magnificently. One of the things that I think we should learn from that is when this pandemic is over, we need to have a reappraisal of who does what, and we need to make sure that um, care workers are recognized, trained, and remunerated for the fact that they are doing higher level things during this pandemic, which I hope they will continue to do probably after this pandemic. I think where the lessons that we've learned are, we've certainly learned the lessons of interdependence between health and social care. We have certainly learned that social care is a vital part of our system and the profile that we've got is something that is really important and needs to be capitalised on at the end of this pandemic. What I would say is there have been a lot of lessons learned and let's not go back to business as usual after this. Let's see how we have positioned ourselves and repositioned both housing and care and make sure that we build on that foundation for the future. What we've also seen, I'm afraid to say, is that some of the organisations around government are not fit for purpose. They have shown themselves to be weak in both capacity. Uh, their cultures have not been, uh, in, you know, not been suitable for instant decision making. And there have also been some issues about competence. And I think we need to have a root and branch review around some of those agencies. So, for example, it's not been helpful that PPE have issued about six iterations of the guidance to care homes. That is not helpful. And some of those um, uh, organisations need to have root and branch reform. I think we've also learned that social care can embrace technology. And we have seen some really brilliant examples of how a lot of the um, stuff that we did didn't used to do is now just happening as a matter of course. So we're seeing things like virtual uh, connections between uh, some NHS staff and care homes. We're seeing everybody now getting onto NHS mail so we can transfer information seamlessly across the system and we need to really focus on that. We've also seen I think that the staff are really high level competent professionals and out of this we need a proper training and development framework. We need better reward for staff so their money must increase. We need to have proper career pathways in both health and social care and they should start to be integrated. So I think that's a, a really important thing that's come out of this. I think also government needs to realise that local authorities are probably not the best mechanism to deliver support. And we need to have a root and branch look at whether localism is fit for purpose. Certainly it's been shown to be not fit for purpose in this emergency. So I think we need to think more carefully about why we have localism and what the benefit of it is. And at the end of it, I want to see some much clearer criteria about what's local and what's national. So I think that has come out of the, of the pandemic. So in short, a fantastic response from both care and housing amazing staff, some challenges in the system and the way in which integration has proven not to be a reality and we've now made some strides that we need to hold on to. And for the future, I think this is our moment for a paradigm shift 
where we will reappraise what housing and social care contributes and see it as an absolutely essential part of national infrastructure. Donna, I think that's all I really want to say by way of uh, a few introductory remarks. Great, thank you so much, Martin. We've had a few questions coming in, so hopefully we'll have time at the end to answer them. Uh, one right. specifically for you that I'll come back to. So, um, yeah, thank you, Martin. I'd now like to introduce Jane Ashcroft, CBE. So Jane is Chief Executive of Anchor Hangover Group and is an ILC partner. Jane joined Anchor in 1999 from Bupa. Jane was appointed Chief Exec of Anchor in 2010. Anchor Hanover is England's largest not-for-profit provider of housing and social care for older people. Jane was a founder of the Associated Retirement Community Operators and is also Vice Chair of the National Housing Federation, which represents housing associations across England. So Jane, uh, could I just uh, ask you to have a look at these questions and uh, please do feel free to answer all or some of them, the ones that are most pertinent to you. Thank you, Jane. Great. Thank you Donna and uh, afternoon everybody. It's uh, always good to catch up with people virtually. Um, if for those of you who haven't come across Anchor Hanover before, uh, Donna's description was very accurate just to give some context. So we provide services to older people across the housing and social care continuum. We have about 55,000 residents living in our services from the age of 55 up to 108. Um, we have a significant number of centenarians. Um, we operate from 1,700 sites across 92 local authorities in England and a workforce of about 10,000 people. And one of the key points I would make is the range of services, which I'm sure we'll come on to, and I know some of the chat and the questions have focused on this there are some very significant differences between the types of services that we offer across the housing and care spectrum um, in terms of what we've been focusing on and what we've been doing everything we've done in the last eight weeks or however long it is has been about enabling colleagues across the organization to support residents with whatever setting they're living in and I know that's a statement of the blindingly obvious but I think everything comes from enabling colleagues to support residents. Um, and I would say at a kind of macro level, what we've been doing, we've been making decisions at pace in a vacuum. So, you know, when I take a moment to just reflect for the whole sector, the sectors, as indeed for everybody in, in society, we've had to make decisions at speed, often in, a, in the vacuum of the kind of information that we would ideally like. And what we've been also trying to do is distill clarity in a very confused environment. I think as individuals, we've all been seeking clarity where it isn't possible to find it. And that has led us to really have to try and understand the people who use our services and the difference between different people, whether they're living in residential care settings. So we have 114 residential care homes with a strong focus on dementia care. Um, and we also have a lot of traditional sheltered housing where people live with us on a rented basis. Um, and we have newer models of care around extra care and retirement villages, many of those where people have bought um, independent living apartments with us and they're using uh, facilities on site. So really being clear what the needs of the people using our services are at this particular time and trying to focus on those has, has underpinned the things we've been doing. At a practical level, um, what we've been doing is uh, some very uh, practical things about understanding where to get hold of PPE, um, where to get it, what we need. Martin referenced the fact there's been at least six changes in the PPE guidance and keeping up to speed with that, accessing that, um, funding that and the logistics of getting it around the country have been a huge, uh, huge focus for us. Um, I absolutely accept we have the benefit of being a large national organisation with a procurement team and my procurement team have been amongst the many heroes who don't wear capes because they have done a brilliant job of managing to access uh, PPE for us at what we know has been a difficult time for everybody. Um, we've been trying to gather data, we've been trying to understand, um, so the traditional rules of how we work out what, what's working in our organisation have been thrown up in the air and so one of the things that we've been trying to do is make sure that we're data gathering as we go and that's about getting information from the people who use our services as I say so we've had a huge amount of contact with customers we've been involved in befriending services adding services to help people through this tough time in the very early days one of the things we needed to do was really understand the impact for our workforce so the, the issues about self-isolation, vulnerable groups, uh, all of those things, 
how many of our workforce were going to be affected because fundamentally the services that we provide are about a safe environment and then the delivery of service by brilliant frontline colleagues um, and that, that working through those workforce issues has been huge and we've been on a major recruitment drive and we've been able to recruit and I'll talk a little bit more about our recruitment process um, so um, those are some of the key areas really PPE testing um, workforce availability um, listening to our residents trying to support our residents give people clarity where there isn't necessarily any available and lots and lots of monitoring to try and build up a database from which we can make decisions about the future so in terms of how have we coped um, I think on the whole we've done pretty well considering um, on a very practical level we have um, a significant number of our services that haven't been impacted directly by the virus which is uh, fantabulous and there's also there's almost a, um, a kind of two world strategy going on we have services that have carried on obviously they have been affected by lack of visitors and they have been affected by um, staff now needing to wear masks in those settings but in other ways things haven't dramatically changed and then we have had services where we have had to deal with the consequences and the realities of, of living with covid um, I would say the toughest points over the last sort of eight weeks have been around those early days in workforce availability. So of a workforce of 10,000, we had 1,800 people unavailable one day, I remember, um, which was around self-isolations in particular. Um, and that was incredibly challenging to make sure we could still run services. Um, and it's also been tough um, handling people's fear and anxiety. And some of that has been driven by the general kind of some of the messaging, the media, social media, and just trying to help whether it's colleagues or residents work through the, the reality for them alongside some of the kind of mass messages which have, have created fear and anxiety. From our point of view, I guess we had a strong foundation going into this. Um, if I look at our CQC ratings, um, if I look at our uh, your care rating, if I look at feedback from customers, if I look at our workforce stability indicators, we were fortunate that we had a relatively strong foundation going in. And I don't think that's necessarily the case, unfortunately, for every organisation. Um, and I think that's one of the, the lessons which perhaps we'll come back to later on. Um, I do think some of the things we've been able to do is to move at pace as the whole sector has moved at pace and be able to make decisions in order to move forward. Um, and generally, I think we have, we've always had quite an active uh, risk register and a sort of proportionate approach. Um, I think anybody in Anchor Hanover who thought that the risk register was a static thing that sat on a shelf has learned some lessons because we have really had to think about how we manage the organisation from a proportionate point of view and think a lot about scenario planning. Um, in terms of uh, innovation there's lots of issues around IT and I'm sure everybody will talk about IT just the very fact that here we are zooming together um, and I, I, there's a huge amount of learning across all businesses and um, I would also add though how care homes have replaced actual visits with using technology to keep residents connected to families and, and the same is true in our, our housing settings too there has been some really creative um, and meaningful links built at a time when we, we haven't physically been able to enable people to keep in touch with their families. And I think there's some brilliant stuff there that we'll definitely take forward. Um, I mentioned our befriending service. So we have at speed been able to identify the residents in our housing services who have no support, no family maybe, and who have needed more than the practical support which we've provided. So we've been able to redeploy um, colleagues from some teams um, sales teams being the obvious areas, but a number of areas where people haven't been able to continue with their day job, we've redeployed people and we've focused them, in, them on outreach and befriending activities. And our recruitment process has just been transformed. Um, we have recruited, uh, we've had over 5,000 um, applicants and we've had people from application in on, in on the floor on a care home within a 10 day period and that's with onboarding training and, and with compliance. So some really fabulous innovation for us there. I think for policymakers, the lessons um, are manifold. Um, don't make decisions based on media stories and speculation, make decisions based on data. Um, this is an incredibly fragmented system. I think you know, we all knew that social care was fragmented 
this has really demonstrated it's taken a long time for people to be able to to have a dashboard that looks across the sector um, and the learning from how we can take this diverse fragmented se sector um, and and do things effectively i think is a really important area for policymakers to think about um, and i suppose one of my main reflections is just look how quickly we can move when we need to and um, the things that have happened in housing as well some really positive uh, work around reducing homelessness, reducing rough sleeping, all the way through to some of the changes that have been made around the way that we operate in social care. We mustn't lose some of those great initiatives. Donna, back to you. Great, thank you so much, Jane. Thank you. We're still getting lots of questions coming in, so don't forget to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions. So our next speaker is Shirley Hall. So Shirley is Head of Innovation and Wellbeing at the Extra Care Charitable Trust. Shirley has a background in general nursing and worked at the British Heart Foundation for 18 years, heading up the regional team and managing their flag flagship Hearty Lives programme, which addressed inequalities in cardiovascular disease. She joined Extra Care in 2013 to oversee their wellbeing and dementia services, as well as expanding services into the communities around Extra Care locations. She also oversees the use of smart technology to improve health and well-being for the residents. So Shirley, over to you for your presentation before we move on to some of the key questions again. Thank you, Shirley. Okay, thank you, Donna. I just wanted to put up a couple of slides that just set out who we are. Um, we are a registered charity um, and our vision is better lives for older people. Um, and we reinvest our surpluses from the charity um, with funding from mainly our residents, from government, local and central, but charitable donations and um, also our charity shops. So if you just move on to the next slide. So it, it really is about us providing those retirement communities, sustainable communities, it's homes that older people want, lifestyles they can enjoy and care if it's needed. So we probably um, offer domiciliary care to about 20% of our residents. Um, and as Jane said, we've got a wide range of, of older people ranging from 55 up to people um, 100 plus. So just to go back to the questions, um, very similar to, to what Jane um, and Martin were saying already, that what we have done is had to react really quickly. We've needed to be ahead of the curve um, and to literally, the minute any government guidance has come out, we've had to interpret that. Um, I think it was Jane that said about the different versions of PPE. I can't tell you which, you know, how many versions we're on in terms of our PPE posters and our guidance. We're probably about version 10 of our location infection control plan. Um, so we've had to react very quickly. But what's been really good to do is to link up with all the other organisations in our sector, retirement um, community providers. We have a weekly call where we can discuss and interpret, you know, what do, what do the people think about the guidance on PPE? What does that mean for our residents? Um, and to share a lot of those um, communication, to share a lot of documentation. Um, so I think that's worked really well for us. Um, to understand how we can really best care for our residents, look after them. Um, and I think Martin, you talked about going into lockdown. What we did is we called it location isolation. So we said from the very early days, you know, we restricted visitors. Um, we wanted to keep our residents safe in that environment. And we think we've been able to do that really well. Um, so producing communication for staff and residents, you know, our residents are really vocal, which is fantastic. We want them to be vocal. We want them to ask, you know, what, what can we do to support them? So we've been sending out posters for residents and we've been sending out letters. Um, if we have had a case, we've made sure that we've put up a post for residents so they, they're very clear that they don't get any miscommunication because there has been a lot of that. Um, and the same for our staff as well. Um, so some of the things I think we've done to cope well, aside from uh, producing all the documentation, interpreting the, the governance, um, we have done things like put some incentives in for our staff. We were really worried in the first few weeks when, uh, as Jane said, you had a lot of staff that were self-isolating. We didn't have as high numbers, but we want, what we wanted to do is reassure them that actually they wouldn't be penalised, that we would be able to pay them for self-isolating, that actually we would offer enhanced rates of pay for them, particularly for our night workers and for working long hours. Um, I did notice very briefly a question about um, providing food. So again, we wanted to make sure if our staff were working a 12-hour shift, 
that they would be able to get food from extra care, that they wouldn't be um, you know, one of those care workers or NHS staff that was leaving at 10 o'clock at night and found nowhere in the supermarkets. Um, so we, we did an awful lot of um, online training as well. We've uh, redeployed our head office staff to support the locations. What we didn't want locations to think of, and we have 20 uh, quite large retirement communities, is to think that the staff in head office were busy working on all the documentation and guidance, but actually we needed to say, we're in this with you, we're in it together. So making sure that we provided a lot of training around care, around um, safeguarding, um, infection control, all the COVID um, e-learning that we got access to. We managed to do that really quickly to make sure that the staff going into locations from head office could also cope and support uh, residents and staff. Um, PPE has been absolutely huge for us, as, as Jane and Martin said. Um, and again, we've been really lucky. We've had a procurement team working completely just on getting PPE. Um, and so for us, in some ways, although it was tough and we had to constantly reply to emails, you had to literally reply within half an hour to get our allowance either from the local authority or to make big orders. So we made big orders at obviously an extra cost, but it just meant that we could make sure we could distribute that to our staff. Um, testing is great that it's now more widely available, um, but obviously we could have all done with that six weeks ago when our staff and residents were going into self-isolation. Um, so I think that's some of our uh, achievements, how we've worked well together with other providers. Um, in terms of innovation, you know, Jane again has already talked about technology. Um, I think it's been really encouraging because that's been a big focus of my work for the last few years in trying to encourage staff and residents to use uh, their smartphones, their iPads to be able to communicate. And it was like a, a switch almost overnight, you know, within two or three weeks. We've seen so many residents accessing that, you know, FaceTiming our families. Um, and because we were doing a lot of work in this area already, we were able to produce a lot of guides on how to use Alexa, you know, how to uh, make sure they can contact their family and stay in touch. Um, and things like online shopping. Um, another success for us has been having um, access to external volunteers who could bring shopping to the doors when we're in location isolation and then um, actually using our internal volunteers to take the shopping and take it round to people in the communities. So there's been a real sense of camaraderie about residents pulling together. Um, and I think others will, will say the same thing. It's about um, that, that real sense of community that shows that living in, in a retirement community is a good place to be. Um, we've, we've also um, had an online village, a virtual village, and that was taken from another provider. So sharing that, that idea on the forum, where we thought, again, staff and residents can post messages, um, we've done things like virtual church services, so we've um, broadcast them live from one of our locations. Um, and residents have posted lovely stories, you know, uplifting poems, uplifting ways of coping. Um, similar to other providers, we've done things like balcony exercises, balcony bingo. Um, found about 10 different things you can do on a balcony that we couldn't do before. Um, and by our staff actually standing outside and perhaps going around 10 times a day to all the balconies to make sure that our residents weren't sitting in their apartments without access to keeping them healthy and well. So it was really all about um, promotion of what can be done in, in the home or in the uh, retirement community. Um, in terms of lessons that can be drawn, I, th I think it is that we can react really quickly which we've shown. Again, we are fortunate because we've had a big team that have been able to support this. So we've had a governance team that's met daily. We've had daily um, calls with all of our managers. And so we've been able to react within 24 hours. But what we have seen um, is GPs reacting really quickly. So in terms of them wanting to FaceTime with our residents, in them wanting to call, um, sometimes it hasn't always been as positive if we've wanted them to see a resident and they've not been able to come out, we recognise that. Um, but actually we've been asking this for a long time, you know, that, that GPs can communicate differently with older people. Um, and we hope that that will stay afterwards. We've got one village where we've had um, a medic spot, which is a, a device that residents can take their blood pressure, the GP can um, listen to their heart, can look down the throat and do a lot more diagnostics. And again, that's something that if that is successful, we hope it will stay within the village. And it just means that those residents who can't get out as easily have got a better access to GP services. 
A couple of other things we've seen as well um, is in the past, we all know that if a resident's dialed 999, they might be unwell. A paramedic might have come out and said, well, we'll take you to hospital just to be on the safe side, even though we think that's probably not the best place for an older person to be. But we've seen now, because we want to keep residents out of hospital because of the virus, that actually it, it's better for the resident. We know we can, we can look after them at home, we can offer them the care, we've got wellbeing advisor on site. So actually it's meant that residents stay at home when they might have been in hospital. And again, we've talked about integrated care. We've seen um, a better approach to that in terms of quicker and easier discharge. So at the moment, residents that are taken into hospital will get a phone call from the hospital that says, we think they're fit for discharge, we're going to get them home today. It's almost like a hallelujah moment. Why can't we do this normally? As long as we've got the right care and the right support and the residents medically fit, we are seeing them come home, uh, as I say, much quicker and, and also quicker access to care as well. It seems to have cut through a lot of the red tape, whereas normally it takes several days to get the care package sorted. Um, so for us, I think that's something that we really do hope will stay. So I think, you know, just to summarise what happens next, I hope a lot of the, the, the real positives, like the uh, GPs working differently, um, acute care working differently, um, and more, more um, responsibility, if you like, in terms of our care, and, and also trust that our teams can provide the right care in that environment. Um, I'm really hoping that a lot of that will stay. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much, Shirley. Thank you. Uh, still got plenty of questions coming in, which is fantastic. So do keep them coming for our speakers. And I'd now like to welcome Nick Sanderson. Uh, Nick is CEO of Audley Group, and he is one of our IRC um, partners. In the 1980s, Nick founded, ran, and then sold Beaumont Healthcare, one of the first corporate providers of private pay nursing care homes in and in 1986, that company created Close Care Housing, which offered independent living to older people in their own homes adjacent to a Beaumont care home. Nick created Audley to develop a portfolio of private retirement villages. Audley now has a portfolio of 20 villages with 2,000 properties and 2,500 customers. As one of the founders of the retirement village sector in the UK, Nick has acted as an advisor to public and private sector organisations. He's also chair of the Associated Retirement Community Operators, ARCO. So Nick, would you like to take us through your presentation and then we'll move on to the key questions again. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Donna. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> you've heard a little bit about Audley, um, for those who don't know. Yes, we are um, developers and operators of retirement villages, which would be more generally described as housing with care. Um, and uh, yes, I've been involved in the social care sector from originally the, the development and operation of residential care homes through into housing with care um, as an assisted living model and now independent retirement villages. So I've seen quite a lot in 30 years, quite a few crises have hit us financial and otherwise as, uh, as a sector. Um, I can't think anybody could honestly admit they saw this coming as it did in January. And of course, it was a, a, a real test for us, uh, a test for our business co continuity plans, for our crisis management plans and everything that went with it. One of the great advantages, though, of what we do, as Shirley uh, and Jane have referred to, is the principle itself of independent living, of course, allows us to offer to people who live within their own homes, within our villages, an immediate option for self-isolation. Um, unlike the care homes that I used to operate where uh, many facilities, including staff, are shared, uh, in this situation, our, all of our owners and all of our villages were able to uh, isolate from a very early stage. We were able to close off our central facilities and reduce the social interaction and then had to work very hard to replace those services to allow people to be supported in their own home. So I won't go through the whole list of things but and, and uh, as Shirley rightly says, we've been coordinating between all of the members of ARCO and those providers of, of housing with care to share best practice, but it's generally included the delivery of meals to them within their own homes from, uh, from our kitchens, um, all of our, our shopping trips for them, um, social programmes and interaction uh, using technological programmes, which is a great advance, which I don't think will ever go back. It's fantastic. I had a series of resident forums last week 
all of our villages, 12 of them are actually are on the calls. Um, every one of them on Zoom, six, six members from each village on, on Zoom on, on calls. You never would have imagined that was possible a few months ago. So a lot of that was done and good. And of course, primary concern was protecting our staff. Uh, we deliver care to our staff through our own home care branches within each village, CQC regulated service. Those branches also uh, provide about the same amount of care again within the communities around our villages. So uh, we had the issue of uh, potentially cross-contamination and concerns. So we had to split shifts, make sure that uh, we were giving people uh, all of the appropriate protection. All of the normal challenges with PPE, but again, as Jane rightly said, our um, procurement team were some of the silent stars of this. Um, and we've never really had a shortage and haven't had to rely too much on, on fairly sporadic local services. So all of the things you'd expect us to do, the feedback from our, um, from our owners and from, and from our staff has been fantastic. They feel very secure and protected and enjoy very much the benefits of living within their own homes, uh, but with all the support of our care teams and everything else we can do for them. Um, I think as a, com as a comparison, a lot of their friends are out living in the community still, isolated in large family homes, distance from their family, uh, with a lot of primary care services withdrawn, inability to shop. I think the, the community model is going to be very attractive to people in the future. But what I really wanted to turn to was your last point, actually, Donna. What does this mean um, for the future? Uh, well, I think we all agree it should be seen as a catalyst for change. We have to learn so much from everything that's been, been happening here, because what we've seen is the silos that have existed for so long in the home care, residential care, care community, NHS sectors, both through regulation, commissioning, um, everything has kept them in those individual silos. As, as Martin rightly said earlier, we've got different procurers of different services in different places that has to go and has to be changed what we've seen through the hospital discharge program is a perfect example 15,000 people discharged from hospital um, who were able to find places in the community whether in our villages whether in residential care or back in in their own homes supported by home care one has to ask why they were there in the first place that's had dramatic impact on care homes who've had to pay, take up a huge amount of the strain in this and have done, I think, fantastic work. Um, but why didn't, weren't people aware of what they were doing before? Why were they so ignored by uh, the NHS and by government, frankly, in the past, when suddenly they've become the most important, uh, a hugely important part of social care? I think it's also throwing up the issue of who are the vulnerable here? Who are the people who need to be protected in situations like this? Um, elderly, yes, but also those with underlying conditions which need to be identified early. So how do we protect them in the future? So going to the next slide, um, a simple, um, a simple, uh, simple analysis from someone who's been working in this space for a long time. The triangle or the pyramid um, starts ironically with the NHS. The NHS has 160,000 beds in the UK. There are 450,000 care home beds and there are one and a half million people um, having home care delivered to them in the community and through primary care. That's the wrong way around. Turn it upside down, put all of the focus on the community, early engagement with individuals, early assessment of their needs, supporting them in their own homes, adapting those homes. Of course, I would say, the creation of a lot of housing with care and communities to give them uh, even a protection in the way I said earlier in a very um, in a community where you can give them all of that support for a continuing basis because of the access to home care on, in, on demand. Care homes doing what they need most to do which is providing for really complex care needs at the end of life that can't be cared for within the community and then let hospitals get on with what hospitals should be doing which is providing acute medicine to those people who have acute needs, be it trauma, cancer, heart disease, etc. It seems so simple for those of us, I know most of us, Jane and Martin and I have talked for years about the care continuum, how you actually get people early, you can avoid so many of these problems. So 
I really hope it's happened, sort of. Ironically, the Department of Health, of course, is now the Department of Health and Social Care. That should mean a recognition. But it took this to get them to produce a green badge. Uh, it took this to get them to encourage people to include capping for, clapping for carers on a Thursday night, not just those who work in the NHS. So in answer to what I hope comes next, I sincerely hope it opens up a debate uh, where some of these issues can be dealt with and, and the mistakes that have been made and the lessons learned, and the positive lessons of uh, great innovations from all of us and all the things that are happening very much in the home care community as well and in our retirement communities and in care homes may just at last mean we look at this the right way around because by the way one of the great advantages of what we do in the housing with care world is also address some of the issues around the housing problem in the uk which is too many people under occupying large homes if we could stimulate them to move through it also has the added effect of helping the housing market too, freeing up family housing for the right people. So there are so many benefits to come from this. Uh, and actually, ironically, over a 20 year period, it would actually cost the state less. So uh, there's my uh, agenda in a brief five, seven minute piece. Um, uh, I'll be certainly doing my bit and I know others on this call will be doing theirs to uh, hopefully make sure this is not forgotten as politicians too often do. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. So just over to our last speaker today, Tom Owen, Director of My Home Life. So Tom has been working with older people for 30 years as a campaigner, researcher and practitioner. Tom moved to Help the Age to Now Age UK, where he took the role of Policy Research Manager, managing all commissioned research and acting as policy spokesperson on issues around dying, social isolation, depression and the lived experience of older people. Tom is the co-founder and the co-director of My Home Life UK, a UK programme and social movement promoting quality of life for those living, dying, visiting and working in care homes. So Tom, would you just like to run through your presentation and then over to questions again. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Thank you Donna. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Um, and bear with me, there might be a dog in the garden barking, but I'll try my best not to let him disturb us. Um, so My Home Life is a small but uh, fairly influential um, initiative that's international now and we try our best really as much as we can to support quality of life in care homes, mainly by working with managers. Um, we've worked with over 2,000 care home managers over long periods of time um, to support them to really continue to do the great work and uh, deliver quality of life in their own homes. Um, if you go on to the next slide. Our, our vision is very much about supporting care homes to deliver to their potential, but also helping them to feel valued and trusted by those who work with them and that sort of health and social care systems and to be cherished by their local communities. So locally, we work in about the moment in about 15 areas of the country where we are trying to, to, to realize that vision and support care homes in that, in that way. So onto the questions. <clears throat> Um, quite a lot has been said already, so I'll try not to duplicate. Um, I suppose what we've seen over the last month is that care homes have shown the world exactly who they are. They've helped the world to understand that these people are the people who work in care homes, are skilled, are committed, are strong, are passionate, and every day they are giving their love, every day they are giving their love to residents, relatives, and to each other. And it's, so it's fantastic that the community are finally seeing what we already knew about these amazing places. The things that the community aren't aware of is that despite the fact that there has been dismal, dismal investment in the sector for decades, um, actually care homes are rather used to these kind of circumstances because they're used to being um, expected to deliver all kinds of things with very little support from the outside world. They are typically used to managing day-to-day -day crises. Um, they've had some experience of managing infection control. When, they were, when there were episodes of diarrhea and vomiting, they have managed to deliver barrier nursing. They've managed to talk sensitively to relatives about staying away for that period of time. They're used to 
providing highly complex care um, in difficult circumstances and somehow finding ways to interpret highly complex guidance to the very individual um, needs of the home. Care homes are used to, particularly the managers, um, used to be give, giving counselling to res relatives, to residents and to staff. That's a day-to-day -day activity for them. It has been for many, many years. And so that's something of a skill that they've got that they've been able to use during this crisis. So all of these things have been in place for many, many years. But of course, this is a different kind of crisis, a much more overwhelming crisis. Uh, but at least they have that skill and expertise as a foundation. To say, to ask whether the uh, care homes are coping, my, my answer, unlike what Martin was saying, is I don't think they necessarily are. I think it's too soon to say. I think right now we know, right now as we speak, you know that there are residents dying, that there are staff dying, and that there are care homes that are really at their, their wits end, not really knowing what to do. And we know because we're talking to them every day at My Home Life, we are picking up the phone, we're seeing how they are. And so the whole thing around, you know, what lessons can we draw from this, it's a bit too soon because we are right in the thick of things. And it's, you think about the sort of process of, of grieving, actually we're right at the mid beginning, we are in the, in the shock phase. Where maybe we're moving in towards anger a bit, but we're certainly not getting to that point of beginning to accept things. And I would say that actually after this is finished, we need to really keep an eye on our staff and make sure that actually they are not burning out because they're all riding on huge amounts of adrenaline at the moment. You know, and when is that adrenaline going to stop? You know, they're going in, some of them are moving into the homes. Um, and we need to make sure that actually we keep a keen eye on them and rather than add to the bombardment all of the guidance they're getting, the fact that I'm understanding that CQC are still sending out PIR forms to care homes unbelievably, rather than all of this bombardment, what they need are people going in, holding their hands, looking after them, listening to them, and supporting them in very practical ways. Now, luckily, what we're hearing is that care homes are looking after each other. So managers in little areas, where particularly where my home life have worked in groups, they are naturally getting hold of each other and seeing how each other are, helping each other get hold of PPE the last few weeks, um, giving them creative ideas about going to the local tattoo artists and saying, have you got some gloves, et cetera, et cetera. We also know that despite the fact there's been all kinds of failings nationally, they're actually in the local CCGs and local councils. There are some people who are doing amazing work and that actually they are now beginning to start to ensure that care homes are getting daily calls that people are going in, people have been tested, district nurses and whoever are going in to lend a hand. So that is beginning to happen. The other really exciting thing is that what's happened in Nottinghamshire. Many of you have um, seen on the television Anita Astle, who is the owner manager of Wren Hall Nursing Home. And she alongside others, um, including uh, geriatrician Adam Gordon, has set up a very special WhatsApp um, group which allows care homes to talk freely about all the things that scare them, the things that they need reassurance on, but gi giving them immediate response. And that's not about sending them a link to a guidance. Um, that is about saying very queer, quickly exactly what they need to be doing at any given time. So when people are asking, when should I swab? When should I not swab? You know, we've heard this myth and the papers are saying X, Y, and Z. What should I be saying to my staff? Actually, those Anita, Adam, and others are getting the response to those care homes really quickly. And it's hugely impressive what they're doing. So we're not at, out of it yet. The crisis will continue. I say and urge government to really think about how it can trim down the guidance um, and start working properly and kindly and with care to these care homes. They need it. We're also seeing how we've got this opportunity to build on the relationship between the care home and the community that has developed over the last few weeks. And that's very exciting. But there is that worry, of course, that when these, this is all over, we will go back to the way that the relationship used to be between care homes and communities. In the same way as when, as individuals, we are poorly, we are very, very worried about things, 
and that as soon as we stop being poorly, we tend to forget all of the stuff that's happened, you know, the, the fact we were ill. I worry that after this crisis, we might have some sort of short term memory about exactly what had happened and what care homes were experiencing and how we thought about them. What I think we need to have is a connector role, someone who is there as a, um, a friend, a friend and neighbour to the care home that can connect them to the right people, to the churches, the community groups that are there to um, ensure that they have the right information, supporting them to get online, to use all the technology they, they, they can, rather than what we have at the moment, which is the guidance that basically sits on the office of the manager and they, it adds to their stress because they don't know what they should be looking at, what they shouldn't. And all the time when they're looking at that paperwork, it's stealing time away from residents, relatives and staff. I think just to finish off, after this crisis, we are going to need a period of healing and support. And this is not necessarily going to be about one to one counselling, but it's about staff, managers getting group peer support, maybe facilitated, helped to talk about how it's been, to process all of the challenges, but also to, to be very, very proud of what they've managed to achieve and think, right, OK, what can we do now with others to really make ourselves to, to really take forward the future? And finally, while it's not something that I have a great deal of um, understanding of, I am aware that financially care homes are in a bad state at the moment, given all the vacancies and given the costs of the, the PPE that they've had to pay. So there is the real and immediate risk that we're going to see lots of care homes closed and with them, of course, residents, relatives and staff suffering even more. I'm not sure whether that's my seven minutes, Donna, but probably the, the time for me to finish. Great, you're spot on. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. So we've just got one final poll before we open up the questions. And the poll will appear on the screen shortly. So yeah, poll three. Uh, and the question's coming up now. Do you think the pandemic will inspire government to move forward on health and social care integration? And that question uh, will be up there for a minute or so. Thank you. So, do you think the pandemic will inspire government to move forward on health and social care integration? Bit of a split there. So yes, most people think that it will, but there's still quite a few people that think that it won't. And uh, I think there's a, there's a few questions that um, the panel will be asking, will be answering shortly concerning that. So um, there's some positives there, but there's still a lot of people that are skeptical. So um, we've had quite a few questions. So I'm going to open up for questions now to the panel. So uh, we've had quite a few questions coming in. Uh, we've had over 50 questions. So I'm going to try and uh, pick out the ones, uh, the ones that I can for the panel to answer. So uh, I'll go straight through to uh, one question from Gemma Crew. Question for Martin, but also uh, there was another question on this as well. So it's to all the panel, but Martin particularly. Are you concerned about the potential impact on care homes of lockdown measures being eased, especially if this comes in as early as next week? Uh, Martin uh, th or anyone? Th th thank you very much, Donna. Yeah, I, I am worried about that. But I think one of the things we'll need to understand is that when the lockdown starts to be eased, it won't be eased for everybody. And care homes, because they are the centres where people are living who are in the most risk, we might see that that um, lockdown might take a lot longer. And so I think we should acknowledge that it's not going to be necessarily everything back to normal for the rest of us uh, immediately. And it certainly won't be for care homes. Okay, thank you. Donna, can I 
yeah, um, okay. a little bit to that. Um, I, I'm sure we won't see um, huge changes next week, but I think um, Martin makes a, a good point. What, one of the um, uh, worrying aspects early in this process was when uh, age was being used as a blanket in a number of ways. Um, or oh, just a, a really blunt tool. So we all know that people who are over 70 have been uh, told that they should really think about extreme social distancing. But there were a number of other areas in the operation of care services uh, where we were seeing age being used completely inappropriately to make some very complex and important decisions about end of life care. Um, and um, I'm very struck by the fact, I keep coming back to this point about services are very different. Um, certainly in our wide range of housing services, um, we have everything from people living with us who might be um, over 70, but they're incredibly fit and healthy and keen to be out and helping in the local community. Um, and we've also got some people living in our housing services who are very anxious about what an easing will mean for their own safety. Um, and I'm just uh, very keen to make, you know, I'm hoping that the government don't use age as one of the criteria for moving forward. Um, but I do think for all of us as providers, helping our communities to work out how, how they cope, how we support communities of older people to cope with the, the, the ensuing phases of easing um, is going to be incredibly complicated. And in some ways, I think most of the speakers have made the point that we're, we're still only at the beginning of some of these things. I, I do think the next couple of months are going to be incredibly complex because we're moving from some very defined rules to much more uh, variability. So I'm really hoping that the complexity of uh, older people's services is properly reflected by the government and that we don't just see a kind of age blanket because I, I think that would be totally inappropriate and, and it wouldn't be acceptable in any other sense. You know, it would be pure ageism to say anybody over X age has to be um, uh, has to remain locked down, which is some of the things we've seen media speculation about. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I have another question from Mary Bright. Have you been able to get to the stage about thinking about how to support staff who will have undergone, undergone mental trauma? UK already had a mental health crisis and I haven't heard anything from government about practical support. So uh, please, uh, any of you, Vic? Yeah, I was just going to say uh, uh, it's absolutely right. It's true because uh, I, I can say because we have a, a benefits manager who, who is available who is a nurse actually a trained nurse who's available to work with all of our staff who can call in for for counseling we also have as one of our work benefits um, a, a remote gp service and a remote counseling service and the take-up has been 300 percent higher than than we would normally expect so our staff are going through some really stressful and traumatic times and there is a, a need for us all to support them um, and uh, it's, uh, I think Jane's point, I would echo completely, is very dangerous for us to think we're sort of at the beginning of the end, because we're not. We're more concerned actually about the next uh, few weeks and months than we were about the past. When you lock down, you're locked down. It's when you start to open. And our staff are very fearful, and a lot of our owners are very fearful about what happens next. So, yes, we're very aware of it and uh, take it very seriously. Um, yeah, I, I just want to add a, a something to that, which is presumably there will be a range of supports available to NHS staff, and those should be also uh, available to people who've worked in social care. And we should remind ourselves that all the services that are about supporting people with issues around trauma, grief, etc., should be available to everybody in social care. So Nick and Jane are right, the uh, organisations will be stepping up, but also the, the system must step up. Tom? Yeah, um, I think that locally they are beginning to start to offer um, counselling hotlines and um, various sort of psychological therapies. And so I think that is happening in a lot of areas now. Just in the last few days, it seems that's becoming more, more um, common. However, I think for some, particularly the care staff, the idea of going and getting help is not necessarily in their nature. Um, I think that they, there's a stigma around counselling, those kind of supports. And so there's something here about having a presence of someone who is a skilled facilitator with some sort of counselling background going into the home and working intensively with the residents, relatives and staff as a community 
and helping them to process what's happened so that it's not stigmatized, but it's actually part of the whole home's uh, ability to repair. Something that my home life are thinking about in terms of how we can try and deliver that. But I think also there are other organizations too. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is from Isla Hinricks. How confident are panel members that learnings from day-to-day -day operations of the last six weeks is not going to waste after the crisis, in particular greater levels of integration? We've had a few questions uh, similar to that as well. So who would like to go first? Will things uh, change? Well, well I, Donna, I, I, uh, I think first of all, I want to reclaim the term integration and it's far too much in, in the discussion about organisations and not a, enough about the experience people have of services. And also we should look to other sectors where there has been really clear examples of good integration that work. So for example, when I sit on an aeroplane, I don't know when I leave Austrian airspace and go into German airspace, because what I experience is a flight from A to B, but there's a massive process going on in the background. And so I think we need to focus our attention on the outcomes and work backwards, rather than always thinking it's all about the NHS local authorities and care providers. It's not, it's about people who receive services and it's about how we deliver something that works for them. Can I just come in there, Donna, as well? Um, yes, certainly, Shirley. Thank you. What, what I didn't talk about is um, the gold standards framework for end of life care, which we have got accreditation for um, 15 of our locations now. But for me, that's one thing that works really well in integrating care, so that we work with primary care, we work with acute care, and because they know that we're GSF credit accredited, so that for some residents that we know really well, they might be in their last you know, year, months, weeks, days of life, we actually get access to services really quickly. Um, the uh, hospice at, at home, at Millen, um, district nurses come in quickly. GPs talk to us and say, what do you think? What's your opinion? And they also look at the residents' advanced care plan where they say what's important to them. So I kind of feel if we can do it within that environment, um, and I'm not saying it's, it's seamless all the time, but where we can get residents home quickly from hospital at end of life, which we try to do. So if we can do it in that area, then as Martin says, why can't we do that across all areas? But I do worry that although we'll have loads of lessons from this and we want to make sure that we build on them, I worry that we'll go back to our day jobs, jobs really quickly and forget this. So I think, you know, umbrella organisations like ARCO um, can champion this and can take things forward. And there was a couple of questions about how to, to join the, um, the ARCO call just to say that you know members of ARCO are all invited to that once a week um, but it's, it's getting organizations to try and uh, make sure that they're, they're that broker and act on our behalf as well. Okay. Thank you thanks very much Shirley. A uh, question for Martin but I think for um, all the panel as well so um, what do you think the longer term impact will be on residential settings? Do you see a shift away from the residential care, resi care towards home care, live-in care? Or do you expect the stronger, high quality residential care providers to flourish? Well, I think uh, the thing that I would say about that is we look at the demographics and actually there is no one size fits all. And what we need is a very clear approach to having continuums of care where people are in the appropriate services for their particular needs. And we should be looking to how those services are seamless in terms of the movement people have across them, but also that the quality of all those particular services is absolutely um, at the highest level it possibly can be. And certainly I don't, I don't hold with this idea that, you know, somehow we're all in competition with each other. Actually, it's about having appropriate care at the time people need that care. Um, so I, I, I also think one of the things this pandemic has really shown is that there is a need for good quality residential care and also that if we're going to have this very dispersed approach to different parts of care there has to be some mechanism from the centre to be able to manage it. So for example nobody seems to know where personal assistance that are funded by local authorities are. Nobody's been giving them PPE or supporting them with guidance and yet that's one of the ways in which people are saying, oh, the system's all about one set of uh, appropriateness, which is all about being in your own home. 
But for some people, their own home is a fantastic supportive living unit. For some people, it's a fantastic care home. And for some people, it's living in my own house with good quality, appropriate levels of uh, domiciliary and home care support. Yes, Tom, thank you. Yeah, I think that um, there's always going to be a future for residential care and there's an opportunity here for the care home sector to um, develop upon the better relationship it has in the community. And we've been talking to care homes recently about the need to um, start thinking about when this is all over and how they can open their doors and embrace the community and almost send out a message now of like, we can't wait to open our doors and get you in as on, you know, uh, to, to develop that relationship with you. So through doing that, the stigma around care homes might, uh, might die down a little bit and people might see it for what it is, which is an incredibly positive option for a lot of people who are otherwise stuck at home with one or two visits a day and very isolated. Um, and the only reason why they might not be going into care homes now is because they're scared of what they hear in, in the papers. So there's an opportunity for us to reinvent the sector to help people see them. Actually, this is places of love, of community, and yeah, I see a, a really good future for, for residential care. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll uh, just check this question that has just come in. Uh, hold on a second. Sorry, it's going down to it. Okay. Um, won't be a second. Right. I'm so sorry. We're just looking for it. Sorry, when when people have added, it just flicks on. I won't be a second. Um, Donna, while you're doing that, perhaps yeah. I, um, just to build on the previous answer about the different models that people might be attracted to, that might be more or less. Um, um, viable going forward. Um, I do think uh, there is a concern about supply in the residential care sector because there are financial challenges and it's important we don't start with that but we must acknowledge that the viability of some providers um, for a variety of reasons is challenged and I think we will see um, reductions in supply at a time when actually demand will be increasing and um, several people have commented on the demographics. Um, I think I hope the good quality care homes, which are the majority, the vast majority who have been doing amazing jobs. Um, some of those messages have really got out. And, you know, I think one of the social media is a bit of a mixed blessing, isn't it? There's some stuff on there that can very quickly turn my hair even greyer. But there are lots of positive stories out there about just the great things that frontline colleagues have done. And we keep coming back to this. It is frontline colleagues um, in good environments, supported by good operators um, who are making a big difference to people's lives. But I, I do think the future of the residential sector um, is going to be challenging for the next couple of years. I think there will be change and there will be issues about a mismatch between supply and demand. Um, and as Martin said, you know, this isn't a competition between different types of service. There is, there is demand for good quality retirement housing, good quality housing with care, good quality residential care, good quality home care. And the integration point, as Martin said, um, we often, it's all about whether social care can integrate into the NHS. Actually, integration and effective cooperation between housing and care, I think, has got as much to offer, if not more, to be honest, than some of that traditional argument about the housing, uh, the health and social care integration debate. Thank you, Jane. Um, a question from Stephen Burke. How can we rebuild confidence and trust among families in residential care? That kind of links in with what, uh, what you were just saying there, uh, James. So uh, who would like to answer that question? Can I come in there? I was just typing a reply to that, actually. Um, and one of the things we've already talked about is capturing a lot of the good news stories um, and sharing that. You know, so many of us have really positive stories um, about the high quality of care. So I know some care homes have really struggled with PPE and, and haven't been able to access PPE. They've never stopped delivering that really high quality care. Um, so where we've had some really good success stories, and we've seen some of them in the media, I think we really need to promote those um, and, and focus on that. Right. Yes, Nick. Thank you. I think it's um, 
I think it's um, the residential, the concerns that I think are referred to are people, we, we've had it actually recently where I saw something which somebody was saying, um, they wouldn't, uh, they're very, very fearful about going into care homes at the moment. That's a very specific issue around the virus at the moment and that will move on and change. So I think there's some good to be some, I think the other side is that people will see the fantastic work and the, and the service that's offered to people within those care homes. So I don't think it'll take that long to rebuild. I go back to something that was said earlier. I think we have to remember though, the public have little or no understanding of the way these structures that we talk about so casually because we know them and live with them every day. Your, any poll of any high street talk or talking to older people and ask them what they think their options are when they get older they have very very limited knowledge of the sort of things we've talked about that is why the default tends to be leave me alone i'm not going anywhere i'm going to stay in my house until i fall it falls down around me and one of the things that's going to have to come out of this again which we've all been trying to do over the years is try and get a better understanding of what options are what things mean when people explain it, how they're funded, uh, how they access them, uh, then there might be a better chance of us taking them on that pathway through the different stages of aging and, and accepting and engaging in the right ones for them at the right time, rather than leaving it too late and ending up with a crisis decision, which has been why 40% of all acute hospital beds are blocked with older people who've had a crisis who could have avoided that had they made the right choices earlier in their lives. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here on um, infrastructural changes. So what specific infrastructural changes are you suggesting are made, re-offering care workers better pay, a career path and higher status? <laughs> uh, well, Donna, I, I, I'm very anxious to see, for example, I don't know why we have a training um, uh, department in Health Education England that spends £100,000 a minute of taxpayers' money in a supposedly integrated system, and none of that is available to social care staff. One of the things I think we need to do is, first of all, identify some skills and competency frameworks which are appropriate for both health and social care, enable people to have careers where they move seamlessly between the two sectors and they have a really clear career pathway that enables them to do that. We've got to also um, acknowledge that um, some of these roles in social care are very highly skilled, but at the moment they're not being treated in that way, either by the way in which we remunerate or indeed the way in which we acknowledge their contribution. So I think there needs to be a really fundamental look at some of these structures and organisations. And we have to be really clear about what we're doing in relation to this. And I go back to my original point, which is about the outcomes to the citizen. That is the start point. And then we work back to me, how do we support the staff to be able to be professional and move seamlessly across the system in the same way that people who are using health and care services and indeed housing services do. Thank you, Martin. Tom. Yeah, I think a lot of that is about just moving on from what Martin said, is about confidence of the care home sector and managers and staff, that sense of, oh, I'm just a carer and managers saying that all the time and they feel that their confidence is being chipped away by um, you know, district nurses, health visitors and others that are coming in and telling them what to do. So there's something here about professionalising the sector but not losing sight of the fact that a lot of great staff aren't necessarily academic, that they are just brilliant carers. And there's this term used in America called primary technology of care, which is about, you know, listening and engaging. And that stuff is really important. You, don't, you get that. You don't necessarily have to have gone through lots and lots of qualifications to be an amazing carer. So it's about getting that balance in terms of the career pathway and the education. But I really agree with what Martin was saying. Jane. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, the clap for carers, the recognition for the frontline workforce is one of the positives that's come out of this whole situation um, and the kind of redefinition of, of what is critical in society. I think the, the, the bare economics of how we take that forward is something that's really important for government and policymakers to engage with, because saying care workers deserve to be paid more is absolutely right and everybody would stand behind that. 
the income for care comes from two sources. So in our organisation, about half of the people living with us are funding their own care and about half of the people living with us are funded by local authorities. And there is a very straightforward dynamic around um, the workforce being properly supported and rewarded and how that is, is balanced within the, the kind of income into the organisation. So we can't disassociate the rightful recognition of the contribution of care workers and the need to reward that profession and to do all of the things that we've talked about without also getting back to our old friend social care reform. Great, thank you very much, thanks. Uh, it's, there's a question, but it's also kind of a statement. So um, I think there is a big role for volunteers in care homes. It would be good to have this facilitated. Does anyone want to comment on any plans that they have for or aware of for a sort of scaling of volunteering? Tom? Yeah, there's a, a national initiative that My Home Life help out on called Care Home Friends and Neighbours, where um, what we're trying to do is help to create opportunities for the community to engage with care homes. And during this period, it's about obviously the non face to face stuff. But then actually, once we are able to open our doors, to the community it's about all kinds of ways in which the community can be act, act neighborly and the nice thing about that is that being a neighbor doesn't necessarily mean that you always have to be dbs checked and that's of course the, the the worry about managers that that just takes lots of time that they don't have um so being able to try and you know build on on initiatives like that and try and sort of share all the different ways in which uh, the community can come in to read to um even just to sort of share um, stories or photographs from the local area or whatever it might be we've got a whole range of of ideas on the my home life friends and neighbors website what we're hearing at the moment from a lot of care homes is that actually they, their heads can't really think about volunteers it's sort of like yes but not now yes but not now because we're sort of thinking right can we get volunteers to support them now and some of them are saying well maybe a volunteer could go and um, you know talk to the amateur dramatic society and get them to do a presentation like do a, a show in the garden for instance so that residents could look out the window or bring along pu puppies or pets from the animal group or whatever so a volunteer can, that can act as the connector but anything more than that I think is just too much for a lot of care homes at the moment they just aren't ready thank you uh, we've got time for one quick one um, so I agree with the last panellist that we'll have to keep up the pressure in order to make, to make sure there is more integration once the pandemic has passed. With regards to easing of lockdown, I'm really concerned about people with mental health and learning disability who normally access the community on their own. Um, in lockdown, we've kept them safe, but we know they will not manage social distancing and good hand hygiene when they are out of lockdown. Can we raise this with government as supported living has many similar issues to care homes? Um, I, I think, um, Donna, that has been raised with government. And in fact, um, Care England has done some guidance for learning disability providers in this uh, context. And also, of course, it is the same for people in supported living and in residential care. And of course, uh, a lot of people in residential care particularly have some form of dementia. They're living with some form of dementia. So again, the challenges around social distancing are quite significant. Um, and I think that's why we may find that um, for some people, and I think Jane's right, you should not be looking at this in terms of blankets on age or where you happen to live. But for some people, we'll have to be a bit clearer on how we support them during the lockdown. And that may require extra staffing and more support. And that needs to be taken account of with some kind of comprehensive financial package for the sector to enable it to be able to respond in that way. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, and yeah, just another statement coming through is the experience of local areas is vital to the policymakers as well. So yeah, I'm sure the panel will agree with that. So um, I'm just going to do a, a little bit of summing up from what people have said before we start to close. So uh, Martin, you talked about a root and um, branch approach to reform. So um, enhancing the need for virtual connections to continue uh, after this crisis is over. We need to reclaim the term integration. Uh, Jane, you talked about the practical support you're giving to staff that you're having to move at pace, but in a vacuum. Uh, and you're, look, you're uh, supporting um, homes to have accessing funding and PPP and the logistics around that. You, you talked about a two-world strategy 
that you're having to, to move into uh, and, and beyond um, the recruitment drive uh, that you're undertaking, the large one that's been very successful. Shirley uh, talked about the need to be um, ahead of the curve, which they're, they're, uh, they're very much um, doing at the moment. And uh, Nick, uh, there really needs to be a catalyst for change. And um, Nick highlighted there needs to be a move away from silos across all sectors. And Tom um, talked about the urgent need for government to trim down guidance, be kinder and kindlier with care, uh, and the opportunity to develop further relationships that have been built at this time um, across care homes, government and communities. Um, and there needs to be a connector role, um, a sort of friend and neighbour example. Um, I'm probably linking in with, with the work that Tom does, Tom Owen's work. And there needs to be a period of healing and support and I'm sure all of you would uh, recognise that at this time. Um, so I'd just like to, uh, we're coming to the, to the end of the webinar today. Uh, just a few closing remarks from me. I'd really like to thank all of our speakers and everyone who joined us today for this very informative webinar. Uh, thank you also to our partners, Anchor Hanover Group and Audley Group, and to all members of the IFC Partners Programme uh, for making this webinar possible. Please note there will be a recording of this webinar available on our website. Additionally, we will send you the link in the thank you email and feel free to share it. So uh, before I close, I just wanted to mention our annual conference. This year's Future of Ageing conference will be held on the 3rd of December and will explore how we can ensure policy and practice works for today's as well as tomorrow's older and younger people. One session will be focusing especially on how generations have come together during the coronavirus crisis. So make sure to register now at futureofaging.org.uk to make the most of our early bird prices. So this has been our third webinar in a series of weekly, re weekly Thursday webinars we are planning over the coming weeks and months. Next Thursday, we'll be holding our next webinar on public health and policy reform, mitigating increases in the state pension age, MISPA. We'll be exploring how changes in pension policy have impacted on public health and what this means in a COVID-19 context. For news on our latest webinars and to stay up to date with all ILC news, please visit our website at ilcuk.org.uk, join our mailing list and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at ILC UK. We, welcome, we hope to welcome you to another ILC webinar event in the near future. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today and everybody that has participated and thank you for all of your questions. And um, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>